Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our global audience. Welcome to a session on delivering climate action while we feed the world. Before we get into this session, I'd like to extend a very special welcome to Deputy Prime Minister from Somalia, Salah Jama, who is going to give us some brief words. The floor is yours, Deputy Prime Minister. I hope you can hear me now. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, let me thank you for giving me the opportunity to bring to your attention the perspective and the realities in Somalia, the Horn of Africa, and other places in the region as we talk about this important subject matter. And the World Bank as a premier institution on improving the economic conditions and particularly in this era through green initiatives uh, in terms of reforming food systems and the way we do agriculture and livestock is a very important forum for extension ideas. So I think today's subject matter is about how do we uh, improve uh, food systems, decarbonize, mitigate and adapt to climate change. Let me give you a very brief synopsis of what's happening in, in Somalia as we sit here today and discuss climate change. For us, climate change is a reality. 7.2 million people are under drought as we speak. And there is a looming famine. Uh, we are not out of the woods yet, although there is a lot of response to attend to the situation. And I, mean, I see that livestock is an important aspect of the areas that we're focusing on. Somalia is primarily an agro-pastoralist society, and our primary export uh, goods is, is livestock to the Arabian Gulf. Out of the 60-some million livestock that we have, over 10 million have been affected by climate change-induced droughts and lack of water. So I want to be very brief and rather listen to the discussion, but I would like to highlight that there is a need for developmental organizations and multilateral financial institutions to play a fundamental role in the prevention of droughts and lack of food and shortage of water through developmental model. Much of it is being addressed in a humanitarian context, but I think the discourse on climate change and the analysis that were provided in various forums during this COPE gathering helps us understand the nexus between development and climate change. So if you go part towards a long-term durable solutions, I understand humanitarian issues have other forums, but from purely developmental perspective, I think we must understand that the livelihoods and the food systems of millions of people have been disturbed. disturbed. And I think the onus is on us to find sustainable and durable solutions to find productive means for hundreds of millions of people in Africa, particularly 3.5 million Somalis who are displaced, former farmers and, and uh, uh, nomads looking after their goats and camel. My advice to the audience here is we must find ways to not only decarbonize and mitigate, but also integrate that into adaptation mechanisms in order to resolve these reoccurring droughts. For the last 30 years, we have had 18 droughts, a couple of famines, floods. This needs intervention in the energy sector, intervention in the water systems, intervention in the overall economy. So we would like to bring to your attention that it is about time that development institutions and agencies focus on preventive measures through sustainable long-term planning of development programs. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Prime Minister, and uh, indeed a terrible situation facing the country and just really highlighting how broken our food system is today. And we're going to hear about some solutions to this particular problem. So I'm very excited that we have this panel here and we're going to focus on how food systems can deliver results when it comes to climate change. Now, we're also going to hear about how we can scale up finance in this space. But before we get there, I'd like to invite Monsieur Benoit Bosquet from the World Bank 
to uh, give some introductory remarks. Over to you, Benoit. Thank you very much, uh, Julian. Distinguished panel, Deputy Prime Minister, thank you for your very sobering uh, remarks about uh, the current situation in uh, Somalia. So good morning, um, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody connecting to this event as we discuss the essential topic of delivering on climate action while feeding the world. We're indeed facing overlapping crises of climate change and global hunger, exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic, ongoing conflicts, and record high food prices that are pushing millions of people into extreme poverty and hunger. Now, in spite of today's daunting crises, the world's food systems will have to become much more productive by 2050 if we are to feed a global population of 10 billion people while also reducing greenhouse gas emissions. We don't have the choice. Greenhouse gas emissions from food systems are even higher than previously thought, accounting for about one-third of the total. Rice alone causes around 10% of global anthropogenic methane emissions and is also responsible for nitrous oxide emissions, two very powerful greenhouse gases. Rice is grown in flooded fields, releasing methane, while poor absorption of nitrogen-based fertilizers, often overused by farmers, leads to nitrous oxide emissions. On top of that come emissions from the burning of rice residue and loss and waste, waste in the food value chain. And yet, rice is a staple of food for more than half of the world's population and an important source of livelihoods for 200 million farmers. Turning to solutions now, the good news is that the solutions out of this situation actually exist. We can co-create global food systems that heal rather than harm the planet. And for the first time, this COP, COP27, focuses strongly on agriculture and food, emphasizing this nexus between food and climate change. This is long overdue, and we welcome this focus. To help secure the triple win of higher agriculture productivity, increased resilience to climate change, and lower greenhouse gas emissions, we need to accelerate and scale up the adoption of climate smart innovations. Climate smart agriculture is not just good for the climate and agricultural productivity, it is also good for people. It can boost farmers' livelihoods, restore and protect landscapes that people rely on for survival, produce more food to meet growing demand, and improve the resilience of farmers and the food systems to climate shocks. In the case of rice, and I will focus on rice because it's such an important staple, technologies and practices exist for low carbon rice production that can simultaneously increase productivity, improve climate resilience, and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The World Bank is committed to helping our countries achieve this triple win, having invested nearly $3 billion this past fiscal year alone at the country's requests. And as you may know, the World Bank is also the largest provider of development finance for the sector. And yet, there is so much more work to be done, and we heard from the Deputy Prime Minister a very uh, impassioned plea. Through the World Bank Group's Climate Change Action Plan 2021-2025, we are stepping up our support for policies and technological innovations that promote climate-smart agriculture. In East Asia and the Pacific, the region where I work at the moment, the bank has already demonstrated that these climate smart solutions work at scale. In the Vietnam Sustainable Agriculture Transformation Project, over 220,000 rice farmers in the Mekong Delta have adopted improved seeds 
and a package of smart practices that have delivered an astounding triple win. Greenhouse gas emissions have been reduced by 7.3 tons of CO2 equivalent per hectare per year. Water use has been reduced by between 15 and 40 percent. And farmer yields have increased by between 10 and 18 percent, while their profits grew by over 28 percent. And this is just one example of our investments. But in addition to landing, the World Bank is also with working with countries to scale up climate smart agriculture through analytical services and policy advice. One of the latest examples of this is a new flagship study on the decarbonization of agriculture, which will assist countries in identifying pathways for decarbonizing food systems to combat climate change while fostering food security. The challenges of climate change and global hunger exceed the capability of any single institution. And this is why collaboration is needed to make sure that the right incentives are in place and the financing is mobilized at the necessary scale. We must rise to the challenge of transforming food systems globally, creating an environment that will enable farmers and agribusinesses to embrace new climate resilient technologies and approaches will require governments, the private sector, and the international development community to finance this transition to greener production of key commodities, including rice. It is more urgent than ever to find solutions for both delivering climate mitigation action and feeding the world. The World Bank is the biggest multilateral funder of climate investments in developing countries, intends to go further in helping our clients reduce poverty and tackle climate change. Thank you. Thank you very much for those uh, impassioned words, Benoit. So now we're going to get to the second segment of this session, and we're going to hear from uh, the Minister of Agriculture from um, Bangladesh, uh, Minister Razak, who I had the pleasure of meeting uh, just two weeks ago at FAO. We're also going to hear from Rick Duke, the U.S. Special Envoy for Climate, we're going to hear from uh, Ms. Semedo, the Deputy Director General of FAO, and from uh, Ms. Uh, Van der Ven from Rabobank. And uh, welcome all. So let me kick off with the first question, and uh, I'm going to ask all of you to answer this question, and we'll go to um, the Minister from Bangladesh first. How can food systems deliver climate action including reducing and sequestering greenhouse gas emissions while still ensuring food security? And this is a key question for countries that face the kind of problems that were described to us earlier by the Deputy Prime Minister from Somalia. Over to you, Minister Razak. Minister Razak, I think you're on mute. Could you check your mute button, please? Oh, so. There we uh, go. Thank Perfect. you for uh, giving me an opportunity to speak before this forum. I am really delighted to have this opportunity. In Bangladesh, you know, it's highly populous country. Uh, to um, about 1,200 people per square kilometer. And uh, we have uh, land area of which, which 62 percent are being uh, cultivated. That's also highest in the uh, world. We grow from one field, two, three crops. Cropping intensity is very high. Mm. And uh, most of the time, uh, our field remain under crop. You know, rice, 
gentleman who was speaking on behalf of World Bank, he mentioned about emission and release of methane gas uh, as a which uh, pollute our environment. So when we have crop, uh, we grow rice. In between two rice, sometimes we grow another crop uh, in turnaround period. There's potato or mm, mustard or some other oil, oil crops, legume crops. We uh, strongly believe that we don't uh, releasing much or our emission level is uh, comparatively low. But we know there is a evidence and we have studied though, we have documented though. Our farmers, sometimes they use nitrogen discriminately. And most of the farm, you know, large portion of the farmers, they are illiterate and they are not well trained. Sometimes, mostly they believe that uh, if they add nitrogen, they can get higher yield. Because they, uh, when they add, immediately leaves great greener, and they consider green leaf vegetative, higher vegetative growth, and that will help um, to get higher, make higher yield. So that's the problem. We are trying to, um, we are campaigning against uh, uh, discriminate use of nitrogen. That we are suggesting that they should use uh, uh, less uh, nitrogen. They should not use more than requirement. To us, that goal, these days we have been, uh, we have reduced the price of DAP, diammonium phosphate. It was uh, 25 taka per kg. We brought it down to 16 taka so that they use more diammonium phosphate instead of nitrogen. And we have been taking a lot of measures so that farmers don't use too much nitrogen. That's one we would say that climate smart approach, uh, climate smart agriculture approach. Thank Again, uh, and these days our scientists are working to develop farming technologies uh, which will reduce uh, nitrogen emission. And against uh, climate smart agriculture, uh, apart from emission, if opportunity comes, I'll speak on that here. For example, unfavorable area like coastal area, where salinity is a serious problem. Or some area, they have less rain, comparatively drought prone. How we are trying to mitigate that. We apprehend that it will enhance uh, with the uh, rise of uh, temperature, global temperature. So I would, Thank I'll you. stop here if opportunity yeah. comes. Uh, I'll speak other issues related to uh, climate change and impact on our farming. Thank, thank you very much, Your Excellency. Uh, very, very, very compelling and interesting story. So let me go to uh, Rick Duke now and uh, tell us how can food systems best deliver climate action while reducing and sequestering greenhouse gas emissions and still ensuring food security? Over to you. Thank you. And thanks to the World Bank for hosting this event. This topic is timely, unfortunately, at a moment of growing fertilizer prices, worsening food security, and of course, ever harsher impacts from climate change. It is important that we have this conversation right now. Same time, of course, we always start a conversation about food with the humanitarian imperative to make sure that the world is fed and above all, that children are fed. And I do want to say that I'm proud that the United States government and the US Congress has committed $5 billion this year, over the next five years, for food security. But food security and climate change are inseparable now, increasingly inseparable. Droughts, floods, and increased heat are already impacting food systems. And as we have already heard, Food systems account for somewhere between a quarter or as much as a third of overall greenhouse gas emissions. So in every way, we have to have this conversation about the intersection between food and climate. Of course, that includes both attention to adaptation and mitigation. We need to look at both sides of the coin. And we have to take into account that 
agricultural sources or the dominant sources of methane. Methane in the atmosphere today accounts for fully half a degree centigrade of today's climate change. And agriculture is one of the main sources of methane. In addition, it accounts for uh, the lion's share of N2O emissions. N2O is in some ways the forgotten greenhouse gas, gets very little attention, but it is 6% of global greenhouse gas emissions, and agriculture is at the heart of that. So we have to uh, attend to it together. And so it's complicated, and it can seem daunting, but there are many approaches that can help us to tackle both mitigation and adaptation at the same time. When we improve animal health, for example, livestock and dairy can be both healthier, more resilient to shocks from the climate, and more productive in a way that reduces the amount of emissions per kilo of meat or liter of milk. Soil health improvement improves crop productivity, but also makes agricultural systems more resistant to and resilient to climate impacts. When we do solar or renewables-based irrigation or even desalination, those systems can cut emissions and enhance resiliency. So if we're smart about it, we can prioritize investments that achieve both mitigation and adaptation at once in the, in the agricultural systems of the world. I just want to close by noting that climate finance has grown substantially over the last decade, but unfortunately, climate finance for agricultural mitigation has essentially been flat for a decade plus. So this may not seem like a hopeful point, but in some ways, this very underinvestment is a reason for opportunity to be seized. It's, a, it's an opportunity that we can work together, including centrally through the multilateral development banks, to address. So we all know that agricultural uh, innovation, agricultural uh, technology deployment, agricultural uh, productivity enhancement is at the heart of climate security and food security. And so we just need to work together across the private sector, philanthropic sector, and across the board to try to do more and more quickly to realize the opportunities here. And I do want to just point people to a fertilizer efficiency challenge. Uh, a couple hours from now, we have some really exciting uh, movement on that agenda. And so please uh, walk from this event to that event and uh, join us for some very exciting news about to come on that front. That sounds great. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that, especially about the challenge, Rick. So, um, Ms. Semedo, over to you for this important question. Thank you, and thank you to the World Bank for convening and giving us this platform to discuss about this important issue. FAO and World Bank, we have a long-standing partnership. And also, uh, for the first time, I think, in a COP, we are talking about food systems. Uh, in the past, agriculture has been always put aside because the solution for the climate change was in transportation and energy. But this time, we see that agriculture, as you, it has been referred, contributes to one-third, but agriculture also has the solution, can contribute to the solution. And this is what we have changed the narrative in this COP. Uh, food system being part of the solution. But you ask me how it can be part of the solution. When we, we think and we talk about food system, what are we talking about? It's not only about food, not only about agriculture. It's a systemic approach. The way we produce, the way we transform, and the way we consume our food. Because as it has been said, it's not to have food available. It's to have nutritious food available in order to have a healthy diet. Then, what are the elements we consider that are important? First is to enhance early warning system. The minister or the vice, the deputy prime minister from Somalia talk about what is happening in the Horn of Africa. They have been in four consecutive years under drought, and they have not been able to prevent the drought. You cannot avoid the drought, but we can prevent. If we have early warning systems, the investment is two to five. If you prevent, instead of having to respond, look how we are reducing the investment we need. First, we need to be uh, 
we need to increase early warning system to, for all climate dr uh, driven. It's not only about drought floods, but you have also pests and disease coming from climate change. Second, ensure the sustainable use of natural resources. It has been said how we can improve efficiency in the use of land, water, biodiversity, and also have appropriate practices that are locally adapted. And the third one, how we can have finance and knowledge that are accessible to all, particularly the smallholder farmers. We have the practices, Benoit referred to some of them, it has been referred how we improve the efficiency in the use of soils. And maybe to conclude, to say that agriculture or agri-food systems are the only one where we can adapt and mitigate at the same time and bring co-benefits to biodiversity, economy, and livelihoods, meaning that it's the right thing to be done. Thank you so much for that and very compelling. Healthy people, healthy planet, and healthy economy. Let's hear from the private sector on this important question. All right, thank you very much. Um, thank you for hosting the private sector on this important question. So, I represent Rabobank. We are one of the, if not the largest, agricultural bank in the world. And for us, food security and working with farmers has been crucial, of course. So, what we see in our portfolio of both large farmers as well as traders who source from smallholder farmers is that resilience to climate change is very important and yet hard to achieve. So for the last three years we've been looking especially at how can we help these farmers to become more resilient and to adapt their practices to a changing climate. Um, we've done that not just through our own financing needs but also by really looking at which financing gaps are there. And if you look specifically at smallholder farmers, which I would like to focus on because they represent a very large part of those most affected by climate change, like we heard from the Deputy Prime Minister, yet they receive hardly any of the climate finance available. Um, they're also excluded from most of the payments for ecosystem services markets available, especially the carbon markets, yet smallholder farmers hold amazing potential, like we've heard from many before, to actually reverse climate change, to sequester carbon on their lands. So under a program called ACORN within Rabobank, we have developed a system that gives access to smaller farmers to the voluntary carbon market as a means to uh, finance their transition to resilient, uh, climate resilient regenerative agroforestry. Now, the reason smolders have often been excluded is because of the high barriers to entrance, which is the measurement, reporting, validating of the carbon projects as well as the certification. We've taken away all of that. We've took it upon our own to take away those hurdles as a bank. And now with this additional income stream um, from carbon finance, smallholder farmers on a global scale can get access to the means to transition. And so, I actually wanted to mention, together with FAO, Rabobank has launched the Carbon Farming Paper. Um, this is a, uh, a special paper geared towards all carbon farming practices available, um, explaining not just how to implement them, but also how to get access to specific markets that help finance those transitions. So, thank you. Thank you very much for those important points. And I think this notion that the farmer not only produces food, but also ecosystem services is a very important one when we consider the full package and all the climate implications of what farmers do. Uh, let's go back to the minister from Bangladesh. <coughs> Your Excellency. Tell us how your country is specifically investing in scaling up climate smart agriculture. Uh, you, you have to unmute, sir. Uh, thank you again for giving me opportunity to this important event organized by World Bank. World Bank is our one of the big, largest uh, development partners in our overall development of the country, particularly in increasing production and productivity. 
PT in agriculture. Uh, we have taken several uh, initiatives to scale up climate smart agriculture. Our research program these days are totally focused on uh, climate resilience, uh, climate smart uh, agriculture. Bangladesh has been historically food deficit country. Uh, food deficit, it was a chronic problem. But these days we have in, increased the production of rice. And we are almost self-sufficient in food grain like wheat and maize. But challenges is enormous. As I said earlier, the highly populous country, every year we are adding more than 2 million food security is a formidable challenge. We have Bangladesh extremely vulnerable to um, natural disasters like floods. which happens recurrently almost every year, then uh, cyclone, drought, etc. We are apprehending that intensity of disaster and frequency of the disaster will increase further. Keeping in that in view, we have taken a number of uh, measures. We have to, we think that uh, with or without climate change, our challenge is identical. We have to uh, develop, we have to evolve uh, stress resistance variety, stress to drought, stress to flood, that a crop or a variety can withstand in the water for longer period during flood, 15, 20 days. Drought is uh, sometimes a problem. Uh, so we need a variety, drought resistance variety. And salinity, it's a problem. 25% of the total land area is saline prone. You need a crop which can be grown in mild saline condition. And I like, it's, we are fortunate, I like to note that our scientists have come up with good varieties of rice which can be grown in the saline condition. We are trying to adapt those, take to the farmer's field. Again, um, farmers has come up with some rice variety which can stand longer time in, in stagnated water. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency. We cannot grow wheat. Just, I'll, I'll, just a second. Uh, World Bank has come up with a project of $500 million. We call it uh, Partner Projects, Agricultural Tennis. Uh, Information for uh, nutrition, uh, for entrepreneurship, and resilience. So, with that, we are these days we are preparing a very ambitious project, uh, which will take into consideration uh, climate resilience, climate smart agriculture in Bangladesh, and hope uh, we can reduce the risk and we can adapt. Okay, we're, we seem to be losing the connection here, um, Your Excellency. So I, I think you've made some very important points about uh, how to invest in uh, agriculture to adapt to the changing climate, particularly new rice varieties and drought tolerant varieties of crops. I want to go now to um, this Deputy Special Envoy from the United States. And I uh, understand you have some exciting new programs going on uh, in the United States. Maybe you can tell us about those. Thank you. And I should have started by saying that Secretary Vilsack of the U.S. Department of Agriculture had hoped to be here today. And I'm very pleased to be able to uh, sit in his chair and uh, explain what he is doing as best I am able, but it's a lot. Uh, with the uh, recent climate legislation that we put in place that's quite comprehensive and sweeping and really put us on track to deliver at least 50% reductions in U.S. greenhouse gases 
by 2030. Secretary Vilsack is quite busy. He's putting literally billions and billions of new funding to work. Most recently, two billion in a partnership for climate smart commodities that includes 70 agricultural projects just a couple of months ago that will accelerate innovation and bring down costs for uh, climate smart agricultural commodities for the world's benefit as well. That includes half a billion dollars focused on methane mitigation. So there's a lot happening in the United States on this front. But of course, our work here doesn't stop within the United States. We have to think globally about this global question of food and climate security. And so we have a number of programs that I want to highlight. Pardon me, in that regard. So let me start with the Agricultural Innovation Mission for Climate, or AIM for C, which has now mobilized 275 partners and $8 billion in total investment for innovation in agricultural systems. In addition, we're tackling the question of methane squarely. Last year, we launched the Global Methane Pledge with over 100 countries. We now have 140 countries moving to cut methane at least 30% by 2030. And just to note that when you cut methane pollution, one of the things that you do, whether it's from agricultural sources or otherwise, is you remove one of the key precursors for tropospheric ozone. Tropospheric ozone is not only one of the most potent public health pollutants, but it also harms agricultural productivity. So there's major co-benefits here when we cut methane pollution, whether it's from agricultural sources or otherwise, and we're very committed to that cause. Finally, I just want to reiterate that we're really working on the question of fertilizer and N2O, and stay tuned for this Global Fertilizer Challenge announcement in just a couple of hours. And we're working, of course, on adaptation at home and globally through the PREPARE initiative. So lots to do, a lot happening, and really appreciate the chance to be here. Thank you so much for that, Rick. Um, to the FAO, so research, researchers estimate food systems receive only about 3% of climate fin financing. What can we do to change that situation? Uh, very good question. Uh, we are here talking about the ones who produce the food we consume and they, don't, they have not access to finance. We in FAO, we are not a financial institution, but what, first what we do, we work very close with the financial institution. We work with the World Bank, with the Green Climate Fund, with Rabobank, to promote how we can facilitate the smallholder farmers' access to finance. We provide data, information, metrics that will be able to formulate and to evaluate the project. And we do advocacy for additional resources to be allocated to agriculture. I just had a meeting with the Green Climate Fund. They are doing their replenishment. And they said, FAO, please advocate for more resources in agriculture. We work with the World Bank in formulating projects. To, uh, to finance in agriculture. And we bring a technical knowledge and expertise, but we also do uh, uh, good practices that can be scaled up and integrated in the financial submission. But we also work on new mechanisms like the carbon markets. They are new, but is an opportunity for the smallholder farmer to assess to new facilities and this is what FAO does. We promote sustainable transformation and adequate finance advocating for more resources to the sector and the transformation of agri-food systems. Thank you so much for that. And I have to say, FAO has been instrumental in helping the World Bank get its Climate Smart agri por Agriculture portfolio up to about half of the lending we do in agriculture every year. So very impressive result from a premier technical institution. Emma, how can we get the private sector more involved in this space? So the private sector, speaking on behalf of Rabobank, what we see is that there's a lot of willingness to finance these types of interventions, yet smallholder farmers, like we see, uh, are very hard to reach. So by first uh, connecting them to markets that can repay any investments, we don't put recourse on the agricultural yields, and yet we put still mobilize the money that can be at scale 
uh, invested into these regenerative practices. So we see carbon markets as an additional income stream for smallholder farmers that through Acorn we can unlock and that can also function as the repayment system while the transition to more gen regenerative agroforestry, for example, can yield much higher uh, produce and can increase the resilience and therefore diversify income as well. So without asking farmers to finance that transition themselves, we can still give them access to that money just by mobilizing payments for ecosystem services to finance the transition. Thank you. Fantastic. And so we've heard some really exciting ideas of how we can transform the food system and really make it deliver this triple win on healthy people, healthy diets, and healthy economy. Now, please join me in thanking our panelists, Minister Razak, as well as Rick, Emma, and Maria. Thank you very much for this great session. Mm -hmm.